Hello everybody, my name is Kyle Smith. I'm the activity programmer right here at the Wellington County Museum and Archives. And what I would like to do today, what this is, is this is an opportunity for me to take you behind the scenes to look at some of the real interesting and fascinating stories, artifacts, and places here at the museum that, you know, even if you've been here a bunch of times before that maybe you haven't seen. Uh, so we're going to do that in just a minute, uh, but before I do that, I would just like to start by saying I get asked all the time as to what the best artifact or the coolest artifact or my favorite artifact here at the museum is. And without fail, I always say it is right here. It's the building itself. Uh, the Museum and Archives, what it used to be before it was a museum, was it was the Wellington County House of Industry and Refuge. Actually, if you look right up on top of where that door is now, there is still currently a sign that says House of Industry, 1877. And what House of Industry was, uh, was a fancy word for poor house. That's what most people called it. And it was a place where if you lived in Wellington County and you didn't have any means to provide for yourself, you didn't have any family or friends to look, help to look after you, and you needed a little extra assistance, instead of living on the streets uh, begging for money, instead you could be brought here, uh, you would live, Right upstairs, that top floor there is where all of the bedrooms were. This is a place where you could sleep. And then underneath that, in the floor underneath, is a spot where there's kitchens, you could get food, you could get shelter, you could get the things that you needed. Now, this was not free. Uh, they weren't giving it out to anybody. Uh, it was expected that you would work for your upkeep. Uh, the Protestant work ethic was still very, very important part of how society dealt with the less fortunate. Uh, so this building itself is actually situated on 53 acres all the way around us here and it was an industrial farm. Uh, it was a place where the inmates, which is what they were called at the time, who lived here, would work on the farm, they would do odd jobs to the best of their ability, uh, and they would work for their upkeep here at the museum, or at the poorhouse. Uh, it was open as a poorhouse from 1877 until 1947. At that point, that marker on the front door, they scratch it off, they turn it into Wellington Home for the Aged, and it becomes a retirement home, basically. Uh, and then eventually by the time the 1970s roll around it closes as a retirement home and it opens up as the Wellington County Museum. So hundreds of people uh, lived within its sites, died within its building uh, and we like to, uh, we tell their story. Uh, the whole first floor of the museum if you come and visit talks about the poor house story. It is a national historic site because it is of a national importance. Uh, so it is, it is my favorite artifact, it's probably the best artifact we have here, but I will be showing you some more interesting artifacts because we tell the whole history of Wellington County. Not everything is based around the poor house. Uh, and actually, I am going to pick you guys up right now, and we are going to get a move on, and we're going to go see the next really cool thing that we've got here on tap. So hold on just a sec, let's go! Okay, so uh, we have moved as far to the edge of the old House of Industry property as we can possibly get. We're maybe 600 yards away from where I was speaking before. Uh, and in fact, we're up and over top of a rail embankment uh, in old railroad tracks, which are now the Alora Cataract Trail. So if you're ever biking past, please come down here. Uh, and if you visit the museum, I would recommend you please come down here because this is one of those almost sometimes forgotten about places here at the museum. If you just pay your admission and see the great exhibits we have in the museum, you might miss this. And I would recommend everybody come down here because it is a very important part of the House of Industry story. Uh, I am currently here in the cemetery for the House of Industry. Uh, and the House of Industry itself, the poor house, it was not a nice place to be. Nobody wanted to be there. Uh, everyone who is coming there is absolutely on their last legs. They are at the very end of their rope. They have nowhere else to go. That means there is lots of sickness. There's lots of elderly people. There's lots of people who really don't have any other options. And approximately 600 of those people died right on site. They died within the walls of the old house of industry. And if you had some form of family, if you had somebody to look after you after you've passed, you would be buried in one of the family cemeteries in Arthur or Fergus or Puslinch or wherever it was that you were from. But if you had absolutely nobody, and about half the people who, who died here, they had absolutely nobody, um, they would be buried right here. Uh, and there is 271 people who are still currently buried uh, right behind me in this cemetery. And it's really important to us at the museum that we try to tell their story. So 
this cemetery, it closes down. They stop interring people here in about the 1950s. And at that point, they didn't really know what to do with this space. And so they put up a stone cairn, which I'll show you in a minute, and planted a whole bunch of pine trees, and then they kind of walked away from it. And it stayed that way for 50 years, all overgrown, bushes everywhere, all sorts of undergrowth. Um, you couldn't even get here. There's currently a staircase behind the camera uh, where people can actually walk down here from the trail, but you couldn't get here even if you wanted to. And it was almost entirely forgotten about. Uh, these people who were the, you know, the lowest rung of the social ladder who'd been forgotten about in their life were also being forgotten about in their death. And at the museum, we decided that, that was unacceptable. We didn't want to have that be the legacy of these people. And so probably about 10 years ago, the museum came through, cleared a lot of the underbrush, um, added the staircase so people could access it, put up interpretive panels so people coming through can learn about their stories. And then even better, the most important thing is we actually gave them back their names. Um, we had really good records uh, here at the museum, so we knew who was buried here. Uh, we don't necessarily know where, but we can at least add these markers, which you can see right now, and everybody's name is listed. Everyone who we know about who's buried here, they have a marker, they have a memorial, they have a name, and they're remembered. Um, they might have been almost entirely forgotten about in their lives, but we're remembering them now. And one of my favorite things about this place is coming here on nice afternoons, and I'll come down here and every once in a while I'll find someone who has left um, pennies here, someone's left flowers. People are still memorializing these people, still remembering them and remembering their story. And the museum takes it really seriously and the community at large takes it seriously too. And it's really heartening to see uh, the memorial that's still really a living memorial for this community. Well, the museum's really proud of it and I know the community's really proud of it too. So. Um, this this is the cemetery. I would recommend everybody come down here and see it. It's one of the lesser known or more forgotten about places here at the museum. Uh, but I'm going to go and look at a couple other things right now. So please come with me. Okay, so we have now come all the way up the hill. Uh, we are in the museum itself right now, although if you kind of look around here, you might not recognize it. If you've ever been to the museum, this is not a place that you normally get a chance to see. This is one of those behind the scenes rooms. Uh, we are actually in the attic, and I know it doesn't look much like an attic right now. Uh, it's a little bit cleaner than your attic at home probably, but this really was the poor house attic. That's what was up here. And we, when we became a museum, we cleaned out all the cobwebs, we got rid of all of the stuff, and we fixed it all up, cleaned it all up, and we turned it into one of our storage rooms. This is now furniture storage. And everything at the museum is stored based on what makes it happiest. So furniture is a lot of wood, leather, things like that. And we have the humidity levels, the temperature levels, everything is to make these artifacts happiest, to make it so that they last for a really long time. And we keep all kinds of cool stuff up here. Um, we have other storage rooms all around the museum. Uh, they're all kept to different, we have metal storage, textile storage, things like that. Um, we actually have a quite an extensive collection. And any museum that you visit, or most museums, they generally say about 10% of their artifacts are on display at any one time. And then all the rest of them are in storage. So we do have a lot of storage. Um, you, we don't just leave stuff up here. It's not that we just hide stuff up here and let it get dusty. We do rotate stuff through. So if you come to the museum and you see a new exhibit about, let's say, radios, got some great radios back here, we would put on an exhibit, we'd have interpretive panels, we'd have stuff for people to look at, stuff for people to touch and to talk about, and then we'd have these great artifacts that we can show off. So we rotate stuff through. We try to make sure everything that's in here gets shown at least a little bit. Uh, now, one of my very favorite artifacts is up here, and any time that I bring people to the attic, I really like to show it. It's this one right here. Uh, when I bring people up here, I like to let them guess what they think it is. Uh, so please, guess at home. I usually give people a hint. I'll say, you know, it's from about 1950-ish, uh, and it was quite expensive. It's a very expensive artifact, so I hope you're all guessing at home. All right, I'll show you what it is. So it has two doors, opens up, first one opens up right here. You might be able to guess what it is as soon as I open the door. So as you can see right here, we have a television on this side. Remember this is 1950, so very fancy, very modern. We have the TV right here, but this goes even one step further because this door opens up 
And we also have a radio attached to it. It's a full entertainment system. And to make it go even one step further, this drawer slides out, and we've even got a record player. So all your entertainment needs, you could put this in your living room and you would be the coolest guy on the block. You've got just about everything that you need right here. Um, that's great. Um, this was a very expensive thing. This probably cost about as much as a small car, uh, but that's not why it's one of my favorites. What, the reason that I love this so much is because this beautiful piece of furniture, this incredibly expensive entertainment system, is also kind of impractical. So if you noticed, the weird thing about this is the round shape to the screen. Uh, for those of you who were watching TV in the 1950s, uh, as far as I'm told, uh, television has never been shot in round. Uh, so this really doesn't make any sense. Every single show you watched either would have the corners cut off or it would have black lines kind of around it. It would be a square on the inside of it and it would look kind of stupid. So uh, it's kind of ridiculous. It's this really expensive cool looking thing that really isn't the most efficient. So, you know, I got a soft spot for it. I think it's kind of neat. Uh, and so that's up here. The other thing, when I'm not talking about this in the attic, that people will ask about, tends to be ghosts. We are in an incredibly spooky looking building. We have the big stone tower at the front. Um, it's got a tragic history, like we saw just a few minutes ago. There's 271 people who are still buried here, so it has a really spooky reputation. And this is an attic, attics are spooky, so people will always ask me about ghosts whenever I'm up here. And there is a ghost story, uh, but it's kind of a funny one. So uh, people will come here and they will, they will tell me that they have heard of people who have seen a ghostly light coming from the top window in the tower at the front. And they'll be driving past Laura and Fergus, and they will see some sort of whitish blue ghost light coming out of that window after hours when they know that nobody's at the museum. Sounds pretty spooky. Uh, well, I take people up here. Uh, I take them over to where the window is. It's actually just around the corner over there. And I'll see if they can't maybe see any ghosts and see if they can find anything. So uh, I'm going to do the same thing with you. I'm going to pick up this camera. I'm going to take you guys over there, and we'll see if we can find any ghosts. So don't mind me. Just pick this up. Following me this way, we're going to travel through here, we're going to watch our heads. And you can see the windows right here, that's where the road is. And if I look right there, there is a bluish white, very spooky looking bug zapper. And so that, I suspect, is probably what people are seeing. Uh, I don't think it's a ghost of any sort, uh, unless it's the ghost of lots of ladybugs or something like that. Uh, but there is the ghost. So if you have seen this light and you thought it was a ghost, I'm sorry for ruining a really good story for you. Uh, but I kind of had to. This is this is sort of the this is the tower ghost that we have here at the museum. Um, now that's the attic, and uh, there are a couple other really cool places that I want to show you. So please follow me. Okay, so here I am. I am in one of our artifact storage rooms. And what I thought I'd do here, um, we've seen the attic, we've seen some of the storage that we have here, but I wanted to give you a real up close look at it. Um, now this particular storage building that I'm in, this is where we store a lot of the stuff that's made out of wood, um, a lot of stuff that's made out of leather. So all the temperature controls and everything are, are fit to that. Um, and we've got a lot of stuff that's sort of handheld. I can really show up to the camera and show you some neat stuff. So what I did is I asked our great curatorial staff here if they would fill a box with some interesting stuff that tells really kind of cool or weird stories from Wellington County, just stuff that maybe you want to have a look at that people don't get a chance to see every day. So I'll pull some of them out, I'll show them to the camera, and then, yeah, I'll tell you some stories. We'll, we'll see what we've got. Um, probably, this, is, this one's sort of cute. We'll start with a, a little cute one right here. Little trophy, little victory trophy. Um, doesn't look like much, it's very, very small. Uh, it actually, on the side of it, says Euchre Championship of County Council. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, this was not a team building exercise. Um, this was not something that the councillors were doing on a weekend away or anything like that. Uh, this was not actually even donated by the councillors. It was donated to the councillors. Uh, in about 1927, uh, there was a man by the name of Hugh Templin and he was a reporter for the Fergus News Record, and his beat was looking after county council. So he would attend every meeting, uh, he would watch what they were doing, uh, he was the only reporter who was doing it at the time, 
And he felt, uh, as reporters sometimes do, that the county councillors were spending far more time eating catered lunches and twiddling their thumbs or playing euchre than they were doing the important business of the county. Uh, so in a particular moment of wit, uh, he decided to pay to have this trophy made, <laughs> couldn't cost very much, uh, and then he donated it to the warden. And he said that, you know, whoever ends up winning all of the games that you guys are playing, you should at least give them a trophy for it. They've been working so hard at it. Um, I, you would hope that the warden would take that as a, I don't know, in the spirit that it was meant and a little bit of a joke. Um, but I guess they didn't because they didn't like him very much. Uh, this trophy was obviously never handed out. They never gave it to anybody. Uh, it was immediately sent right back to Hugh Templin. Eventually it makes its way here to the museum. And it does have a heck of a dent in the side of it. You might be able to see it right here. So perhaps they threw it against the wall or smushed it with their foot uh, or something like that. Uh, I don't think they liked it very much, um, but we have it here at the museum now. This is sort of one of the cute things that we've got here. Um, less cute, but more tragic. Be very careful with this one. We have this pocket watch. And this is a good example of something that might seem mundane. It's a pocket watch. We have lots of these. You've seen them everywhere. You go to any antique store and you can see a pocket watch. But this one has a story attached to it that makes it really spe special. So um, put it down right here. This pocket watch was owned by a man by the name of Thompson Beatty. Uh, Beatty family, uh, very well known in Fergus, and had quite a little bit of money. Uh, so much so that Thompson in 1912 was going to head off to Europe uh, to tour around. It takes a couple months and tour all over the place. He was a young man. And before he left, he was given this watch by his family, probably for his birthday. And he loved this watch. He said it was a beautiful watch. It is a beautiful watch. Uh, but he didn't want to take it to Europe. Um, he figured, you know, it's going to get bumped around. It's going to cause all sorts of trouble. Someone's going to pickpocket it, whatever. He didn't want to lose this watch. So he left it at home with his family, figuring he was going to pick it up when he got home. And then he bought, a, you know, Junker watch in Venice is what they say. So he had something else to tide him over in Europe. Uh, when he was done gallivanting in Europe, after a couple months, he was heading home. He was in England at the time. He caught uh, the next steamship home. Very tragically, this is April 1912, and the next steamship home happened to be the RMS Titanic, uh, which, as I'm sure all of you know, tragically hit an iceberg and sunk. Um, now, Thompson was uh, a first-class passenger, uh, but he was also a man, and women and children were going first. He ended up on collapsible lifeboat number four, which was one of the very last lifeboats to leave the Titanic as she was going down. Um, but it ended up filling with icy cold water. They never could launch it off quite properly. And he and another group of men ended up on this, basically in the water for hours and hours until rescuer could arrive. So by the time the morning comes and the Carpathia arrives to rescue the survivors of the Titanic disaster, uh, Thompson Beatty had frozen to death. Um, he is buried at sea. That Junker watch that he bought in Venice um, is taken out of his pockets and given to a family member. Uh, and he never comes back to pick this one up. So this is one of the, I suppose, memorials that we have here. It now has a tragic history, a tragic story that we can tell. And if you go to uh, the local cemetery here in Fergus today, you can still visit his grave. Um, his body's not in it, he was buried at sea, but you can still see it and it says that he was a victim on the Titanic. So what I like about this is Wellington County's always been a part of history. Um, these big international events like the Titanic sinking, you know, has a local connection. And this man to these, you know, huge giant events, was a part of history that we still learn about. And you can learn about these things right in your backyard because these big international events, they affected people here, right? So very carefully put this back. Um, well, let's see, probably my last thing that I'm gonna show you, um, besides the museum itself, probably one of my favorite artifacts because it is so weird and wacky, uh, are right here. It's got a special little box, make sure they don't collapse. It would be very, very bad if I broke these bottles, um, but I'll pull them out. So you can see, simple glass bottles, cork in the top. Uh, there's some little bit of liquid, something inside them. Uh, and they've got labels on the front. Uh, the labels on the front actually tell me where they're from. So this is the from the Royal Alexandria Hospital in Fergus. Uh, and the Royal Alexandria Hospital is what Groves Memorial Hospital used to be known as. It was actually founded by Dr. Abraham Groves. 
And Dr. Abraham Groves was a brilliant surgeon and brilliant doctor. Very important to the local community. He did a lot of good work. Um, he actually, um, the room that we're in right now used to be a hospital wing attached to the poorhouse that Dr. Abraham Groves pushed county council to build. So he's the reason that this room even exists. Um, very smart, but also very eccentric. Um, sometimes at Halloween, we talk about he had a reputation. Uh, people sometimes would accuse him of grave robbery, um, digging up dead bodies at the local cemetery so that he could practice surgical maneuvers on them. May or may not be true. Um, it's a little bit hard to say. He also had a parrot, a pet parrot, which would make house calls with him, sat on his shoulder, and supposedly he fed it marshmallows as he went. Um, parrot outlived him for, by about 40 years, uh, eventually died and was stuffed and then donated to the museum. We have it here somewhere too. Um, but then these particular bottles uh, have something to do with something that Dr. Groves was very proud of. Um, he performed the very first appendectomy in North America. So world-class surgeon, uh, very proud of this. Uh, these are not the first appendixes, but they are real human appendixes. And if I turn this one around, you can see the liquid there at the bottom. And on the inside of it, that big gelatinous glove of meat right there uh, is Mr. Bolton's appendix. Um, and what's interesting about these ones, besides the fact that they are kind of gross, is that they're his and hers appendixes. Um, within about two weeks of each other, uh, kind of at the turn of the 20th century, Mr. and Mrs. Bolton both happened to have appendicitis, appendicitis, kind of a freak thing, uh, and Dr. Groves was called upon to cut both of those infected appendixes out, and he stuck them in bottles, put a cork on the top, filled them with formaldehyde, and kept them as a part of his collection. So he had a human appendix collection, uh, which eventually was donated to the museum. Um, makes him kind of a strange cat, but you know, that's what he did. He was kind of an eccentric fellow. Uh, and I'm glad he was because it is an interesting artifact that we get to talk about here at the museum, the his and hers human appendixes. Um, so that's just three things, simple things, um, but everything we have, we have thousands and thousands of artifacts here at the museum and they all tell a story. They all tell something about the people of Wellington County, the people who built Wellington County, the people who still live here in Wellington County. And we couldn't possibly go through all of these thousands of things and talk about them all the time, but um, we put them in the collection, we put all of their stories in the collection, people can search them online, and we can pull out interesting stuff and talk about them. And so I hope you like that. Um, I hope you come back to the museum and look through stuff. and. If you don't get a chance to come to the museum or something that you're interested in is locked away in one of these storage rooms, almost everything that we have in the collection has been photographed and all the information that we have on them is posted online. You can search through our online collections and all of these artifacts and all of their stories are all listed. And you can learn something about them back at home um, because we're the keepers of these stories, but we don't own them. Uh, the people of Wellington County do. And so we hope that all of you, the people of Wellington County, use them. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm off. Uh, we're going to go to the, to the next stop, but thank you very much for listening to me blab about the Titanic and Euchre and appendixes and all the rest of it. All right, let's see. Thank you all so much for coming along with me as we looked at behind the scenes at some of the secrets of the Wellington County Museum and Archives. Uh, I hope you learned something. Uh, I hope you just plain saw some neat stuff that you thought was pretty cool or heard some interesting stories. I hope you were entertained. And if you get a chance, please come back and visit us soon. Uh, I know that this is, we have such beautiful grounds. You can wander around and, and have a look at some of the beautiful places that we have around here. And as soon as you're able to, please come and visit us. Uh, and actually see some of the exhibits inside, some of the stories and some of the artifacts that we have on display. Uh, the Wellington County Museum and Archives, we are keepers. Uh, we take that very seriously. We are the keepers of Wellington County's story. Uh, and it's your story. Uh, it's everybody's story. And we hope that you can come and learn a little piece of your story. And even if you get a chance, you know, think about donating, think about telling us some of your stories about what it's like to live and work uh, and spend time in Wellington County. Uh, that's kind of really what it's all about. So again, thank you so much for listening to me. And until the next time I see you here, thank you and goodbye.